This may be one of the most incredible places I have ever been. And these little fellows are just part of the reason why. St. Catherine's Island is undeveloped and unpredictable. Located just 50 miles south of Savannah, the island interior is rich with pine trees and live oak. There are jungle-like areas that make it easy to lose your bearings. Dirt roads wind along the 10-mile length of this narrow strip of land. The island is just three miles at its widest point. There are more than 10,000 acres of tidal marsh and wetlands. It is quiet, with scenes that erase the clatter of one's everyday world. Others have enjoyed this island for centuries. St. Catharines has an incredible human history that can be traced back 5,000 years. Today, the St. Catharines Island Foundation owns the property. There are no ferries to bring you here. It is invitation only. Island manager Royce Hayes greeted me at the dock. He's been here since 1975, living in a modest home a short walk from the dock. Royce is what you might call the gatekeeper for the many research programs underway and the scientists who come periodically to oversee them. Gopher tortoises are raised here for the Department of Natural Resources in an effort to boost populations on Georgia's mainland. The tortoises are Georgia's official state reptile, but their status is threatened. So these little fellows being nurtured on St. Catharines will eventually be placed on property where they will have a better shot at survival. It is this type of project that meets the mission of the Island Foundation. It has a long running program to protect nesting loggerhead turtles. It is a wildlife preserve dedicated to science and conservation. At one time, the Wilderness Society of New York was breeding endangered species here, but most of the exotic animals have since gone. It wasn't accomplishing what they wanted. They realized that breeding endangered species was not going to save endangered species, that protecting habitat is the way to protect endangered species. However, the ring-tailed lemurs that were brought here do so well in this subtropical climate, this program continues as an insurance policy of sorts. The only other place these primates run free is on the African island of Madagascar. However, Madagascar has lost an estimated 80% of its forest cover. In Africa, the lemurs are hunted for food or taken captive as pets. Here on this tiny island, they are in charge. Animals come first. If lemurs are blocking the road, you just wait. They came here as an experiment to see if primates could be released and managed effectively. 
uh, and also just for breeding of, a, of an endangered species. Uh, the animals had been in cages their entire life. They had no vocalizations. They had no social structure. And most primate troops have different forms of social structure. And lemurs are, have very clear social structure. Well, they, they had none of that. They, even, they could not even climb a tree uh, in the sense that they didn't know what to hold on to. The scientific name, lemur cata. They are a bit cat-like in their movements and looks. Just listen and you will see how successful this program to keep them in the wild has been. They now have many vocalizations that you hear as you walk around the island. This one may just be an effort to keep the troop together or alert them that a strange person is in their midst. Radio collars on the adults allow the research team to keep tabs on the population and their movements. Zoologist Debbie Belgio lets me tag along with her as she sets food out and checks the troops. This is um, a typical primate bowl um, for these guys. We feed them, um, they love the grapes. Grapes are, are one of their favorites. So every day they get either sweet potatoes or carrots, and then they get a different fruit every day. <laughs> pulling, pulling the bowl. Yeah, it's kind of a it's buffet like... situation. So normally I wouldn't be standing here just holding the bowl. I would be putting it, you know, at the different yeah. places. But they, <laughs> they're all Diego's about Diego's getting all the grapes. Yeah, he's, uh, he's pretty, and he knows that he can do that with me, whereas once I put the bowls down he's a male so with it being a matriarchal society he's kind of you know one of the last ones yeah. and you'll see the females sometimes actually you know cuff or or hit the the males to get them away from a bowl if they're, they're feeding at the time that, yeah she's, she's pulling like, the ball over like, to Hello. her <laughs> she's like, even though the lemurs forage on their own they are given biscuits with nutritional supplements and have shelter for protection against predators or cold weather. A family of lemurs is called a troop, and females are in charge. Lemurs have a matriarchal society, with a dominant female leading the troop. Males are at the bottom of the group pecking order, but there is even an additional ranking system within each gender. Because they are at the bottom of the social structure, know that, of course, when we come, being primates and they are bright, they, they know, okay, this is the, the essentially the feed truck, so um, we're the last ones to get food, so we know that the people are bringing the food, so they immediately come down and are always a little bit more uh, in your face. The other lemur here is, this is Poseidon. So this is, okay, you heard that noise? Yes. That was a little submissive noise. Poseidon is actually Diego's son, and they migrated here from another group, which is very common with the males. And that little noise he made was in deference to his father. It was, you know, I know you're in charge, I know you're gonna get the food, but I'm just nearby waiting. That is amazing. Despite this serious social network, many of their movements are simply hilarious. Hello. <laughs> what are you doing? It's just, they... I gotta get the sun and the lady needs to be feeding me and why are we taking so long? That is adorable. How can you just not? I know. Because you don't, you, know, you don't touch them, you don't pick them up. No, we don't. No, the only time we actually touch them is uh, they get annual physicals once a year. Lemurs sit in a zen-like pose to get heat on their bellies. You are not allowed to touch the lemurs. It is hard not to. There are close to 90 lemurs on St. Catharines. Debbie knows each one by name. If the behavior is off or one is missing, she will know. 
So is this grooming right now? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Those are two females grooming each other. Right. Oh, uh -huh. how cute. That's yeah. called well, aloe grooming. Wh they why groom do they do that? It's just, just part of the social bonding. They, you know, do it also for, um, you know, hygiene. They do keep little ticks, fleas, problems like that. That takes care of it when they're grooming each other. And they are beautiful. My goodness, that tail. Yeah, they are. The tails, um, especially with the ringtail lemurs, with this species, is used a lot of times as kind of a flag because when they are all together just walking, most of the time you'll see them and they'll all have their tails waving. And it's easy to keep up with the guy in front of you with the flag, flying the flag high. As we learned at our next stop, that tail is used for something else. Here we go. That's it. You haven't lived until you've been involved in a stink fight with a lemur. Watch his ears. Okay, the ears go back. There we go. I'm irritated. I'm getting my scent now. I'm throwing it on you. Male lemurs have scent glands on the inside of their wrists and on their chests. He runs that tail along those moist pads, then flicks it at us to throw the smell our way. I'm looking at the threat, and now I'm waving my tail. Throwing the scent. Throwing the scent. And this is called stink fighting? It's called stink fighting. And we know it's a serious behavior, though it looks really comical. The lemur is obviously worked up. Just watch this. Apply the scent to the whole tail, and then wave it toward me, very fragrant. I can't really smell anything, but lemur to lemur, this is the precursor to an all-out brawl. He's looking at your shirt because it's got lemurs on it. I've worn this shirt a million times. This little noises he's making. Aggression. In a real standoff, if one lemur doesn't back off, they will fight, often for the right to mate with a female. Well, I guess you told me. He did, he tells everybody. Ah, <laughs> uh, to be a lemur. Yes, to be a male lemur. Uh, yeah. What a, what a life. It's I like, guess Take that. Take that, exactly. And I guess, too, this is just a very small group, three females yeah. and a male, and he doesn't have another male um, to display to, so I guess we're it. We're it? We're it, so we were told. I have, I have been duly <laughs> reprimanded Admonished. by a lemur. Yeah, well, how many people <laughs> could say that? Right? Not many. We continued making the rounds troop to troop. Normally, the food is dropped off in a very short process. This slowed down version is just for our benefit. The point is to let these primates engage in the normal behaviors they would have in the wild, which gives researchers an amazing opportunity to study them without the expense of going to Madagascar. The lemur program is an internationally recognized success story. But another research program on St. Catharines has also gained worldwide recognition. This is the oldest known church in Georgia, perhaps the United States. It was part of a mission that was the northernmost outpost of the entire Spanish empire in America. In 1974, scientists with the American Museum of Natural History discovered a Spanish mission called Santa Catalina de Bali. These drawings are based on archeological data gathered at the site and give us a glimpse of what life may have been like. The mission was established in 1566 with the purpose of converting the native Wali Indians to Catholicism. This was a large settlement In an earlier video, archaeologist David Hurst Thomas explains the significance of what they found. 
Given the goals that the Spaniards had set for themselves, they were extremely successful at Santa Catalina. And not only were they convincing the Indians in their point of view, but we see in the artifacts and in the architecture a supply line that in this case can be traced directly to the Vatican. We literally have artifacts that were handcrafted in the Vatican that are showing up at Santa Catalina. And there's nothing in our perception of the early history of this country that would suggest that. More than 400 graves of Wali Indians were found buried under the church. And in the culture of that time, they were laid to rest on their backs facing the south. They found um, Indian burials, Catholic Indians in the floor of the church. Uh, and so he contacted Bishop Lassard of Savannah and says, I have something of yours. And he explained to the bishop that uh, when archeologists or scientists find human remains that have no descendants, that they're kept in labs and, and, and uh, museums for study. But if they do have descendants, they ask the descendant population what should be done with them. Since there were no Wali Indians left to ask, the Catholic diocese in Savannah determined this sacred soil should be blessed again and formally recognized by the church. And I heard our most recent bishop recently telling someone, this is ours. And that, you know, we all kind of smiled at each other going, that's right. This belongs, this is, this is, this belongs to the church as much as it does spiritually to the church as much as it belongs to St. Catherine's or to science. Thousands upon thousands of artifacts are now housed in Atlanta's Fernbank Museum of Natural History. Collections curator Bobby Homan oversees rows of boxes from floor to ceiling, packed with everything from stone tools, ceramics, metal, you name it. There are about 70,000 beads alone, glass bottles that held oil or wine, this bowl was found in an Indian burial site. There are pieces of the mission building and a lot of religious items. The one on the left, research suggests that it may have come from the Vatican. The, uh, the words around it, uh, the translation is conceived without original sin. The one on the right is Mary in front of a shroud you could argue there are few collections in the world that have the breadth, the diversity, and the time depth as the one in the bowels of Fernbank. The mission itself may be gone, but the spirit remains. Traces of many different cultures have been discovered on this island, dating back to the time before Christ was born. The island changed hands many times, serving as a plantation for nearly a century. In 1943, Edward John Noble, founder of Lifesavers Candy, turned the land into a retreat where Black Angus cattle grazed. When he died, the land was transferred to the St. Catharines Island Foundation and is now designated as a National Historic Landmark site because of the past human history. This land, this marsh, could hold so much more information about past civilizations. But there is yet another story on St. Catharines. Sea level rise is causing erosion so severe that an entire ecosystem is threatened. Freshwater lakes have been intruded by saltwater. Chunks of maritime forest are falling into the ocean. 
precious artifacts from the past may be lost in this process. The sediment's deposited about 100,000 years ago. Dr. Brian Meyer at Georgia State University has been studying this since 2001. Um, the dead tree. It's that serious and it's that rapid. Um, we see approximately 90% of our shoreline that's erosional. We're losing maritime forest on the north end of the island um, at a pretty good rate, probably around a meter and a half or two meters per year. You can see trees that have fallen on the beach. It makes for a beautiful photograph, but is a harsh reminder that this represents the continuing destruction of an ecosystem. Other trees are perched on the edge, ready to fall. St. Catharines isn't gaining silt or sand in other areas to offset the loss. You can actually watch this island fall into the sea. Using aerial photographs provided by Brian, we put the erosion in motion. From 1951 to 1993, St. Catharines lost 200 meters of land. But in about half that time, the ocean has claimed an additional 150 meters. The acceleration is dramatic. The tides along the marsh are also rising to new levels, and that has an impact on future archaeology efforts. It is a race against water to find artifacts before they're lost to the sea or buried in the marsh. What's happening now with the average tides being higher, just big high tides now are eroding those edges under the forest that did not used to erode. And you're also losing very valuable wildlife habitat. The freshwater ponds, are, except for the ones we've dug, are gone. The changes we see on St. Catharines today will eventually be realized on other islands along the southeast coast. The lessons that we can learn and the best management practices that we can employ on St. Catharines, we can take those and then export that to improve the resiliency and the management efforts on other islands as well. So ponds that used to provide migrating birds and island wildlife with drinking water have been invaded with overwash from the ocean the ecosystem is changing. The big concern for St. Catharines now is the possibility of a hurricane, which could alter the island in a severe manner. I always like to uh, use the analogy of a boxer. Uh, it's like sea level rise is a jab, a jab, a jab, and then a large hurricane or, or a significant storm is really a knockout blow. Um, that surge can produce the type of change we're seeing as a result of sea level rise. Uh, it, it may produce 10 years of sea level rise change. St. Catharines will address its changing coastline as just one more research project. Royce calls this a floating laboratory and a place to work out conservation techniques. The ocean nipping at her heels may give St. Catharines the greatest challenge yet. Even so, the island remains an inspiring place. When the sun sets, water from a rising tide shimmers in the golden light. Lemurs continue to romp among the trees. This is the only place in North America where they are truly free ranging. Here off the coast of Georgia, one of the most amazing animals in the world remains protected and offers hope for a species that should never be allowed to go extinct. As I said in the beginning, this is one of the most interesting places I have ever been. Just being here is special, but one is reminded by remnants of those who lived here long ago. Nothing is constant.
not even the land. St. Catharines is not a tourist stop. Rather, this island harbors researchers and scientists, all committed to understanding the impact of change along the eastern shore. I'm Sharon Collins. We'll see you next time.